1 Rome. This rebellion took its rise chiefly in Rome. James Francis Edward Stuart, the only living legitimate son of King James II of England and Seven of Scotland, resided with his small family and court in a palace in Rome rented on his behalf by the Pope. Located to the east across the river Tiber from St. Peter's Basilica, and on the north side of the Piazza dei Santi Apostoli, the building was known locally as the Palazzo del Re, the King's Palace, in recognition of James' status in Rome since his father's death in 1701 as King James III and VIII, de jure monarch of England, Scotland and Ireland. Here the exiled Stuart court lived and operated within a conveniently located and suitably dignified setting. The Pope had also graciously allowed James use of the Palazzo Apostolico in Albano, to which he and his entourage habitually retired during the sweltering Roman summers. James Francis Edward had been in exile since he was six months old after his father, a convert to Roman Catholicism, had fled to France in 1688 to seek the protection and support of his cousin Louis XIV during the Protestant Glorious Revolution. Long before this, attempts had been made in Parliament to exclude James from the succession while he was heir apparent to his brother Charles. 2. The Exclusion Crisis, who had no legitimate children. Even after his accession in 1685, there was a bid to remove James by armed rebellion led in the southwest of England by Charles's charismatic natural son, James Scott, Duke of Monmouth, and in Scotland by Archibald Campbell, 9th Earl of Argyle. Argyle was arrested and executed in Edinburgh on 30 June. The defeat of the rebels in the southwest at Sedgemoor on 6 July, followed by the execution of Monmouth and the savagery of the so-called Bloody Assizes, Many of the rebels were executed or transported as indentured servants to the West Indies, removed any real threat to James' rule for now. But it was the birth in June 1688 of a male heir from the king's second marriage, a child whom James was determined should be raised a Catholic, that was the pretext for his Protestant nephew and son-in-law, the Dutch Prince William of Orange, to invade England at the invitation of the immortal seven, including the Earls of Danby, Shrewsbury and Devonshire. From William's point of view, he needed Protestant allies in Europe to counter the might of Catholic France, not a sequence of Catholic monarchs in Britain and Ireland who were close relatives, and therefore, he would say, subordinates, of the French king. Crucially, by the birth of this prince, William's Protestant wife and cousin Mary, James' eldest daughter by his first marriage, was no longer the heir apparent, and as a result William's influence would be dramatically reduced. At home, the idea that a Roman Catholic could rule over the predominantly Protestant nations of Scotland and England, and be supreme governor of the established Protestant state church of the latter, was a circle many found impossible to square. James, too, had found this insufferable. He attempted, as had his brother before him, to intimidate and control the Presbyterian Kirk, a form of Calvinism, in Scotland, while introducing legislation across his domains to advance toleration for Roman Catholics, among others, which many within the British Isles viewed with alarm, as the first step towards the return of Catholicism as the state church with the Pope at its head. There was also the troubling business of the divine right of kings invariably accompanied, the opposition would argue, by its even uglier twin, arbitrary government, to which the Stuarts tended to cling, even when it was politically advantageous not to for the sake of a workable relationship with the English and Scottish parliaments, as James' father Charles I had found to his cost. On James' flight to France, the English parliament declared that he had abdicated and invited William and Mary to assume the throne as joint monarchs. The Scottish Convention parliament preferred the term forfeited, reiterating that James, indeed all Scottish kings, held the crown contractually, as set out in the Declaration of Arbroath, 1320, and then invited William and Mary to do the same in Scotland. The Presbyterian Kirk was now established as Scotland's national church. When James' army was defeated in Ireland at the Battle of the Boyne in 1690, leaving him in exile near Paris for the time being, 
several attempts were made to restore him and the senior Stuart branch to the throne by his supporters, the Jacobites, deriving from the Latin for James, Jacobus. The movement gained significant momentum when James' Protestant second daughter, Anne, who had followed the childless and widowed William III in 1702, also died without any living offspring in 1714, for the Queen a great personal tragedy, for the embryonic United Kingdom of Great Britain, since the Act of Union between Scotland and England in 1707, a potential disaster. Both William and Anne had considered naming James Francis Edward as their heir, on the condition that the young prince became a Protestant. Catholics had been excluded from the succession in England and Scotland since 1701 and 1704 respectively. But James' mother, Mary of Modena, and later James Francis Edward himself refused to accept such a deal. James, as his father before him, would rule as a Catholic monarch of all the Stuarts' territories, or not at all. In 1714 the succession therefore passed to Georg Ludwig, elector of Hanover, great-grandson of James I and VI, the Stuart monarch who had personally united the crowns of England and Scotland in 1603, bypassing 50 Catholic claimants in the process, including Queen Anne's half-brother. Within months of the arrival of George I, the Whig party, staunch supporters of the Glorious Revolution and the Protestant succession, won a resounding parliamentary election victory and, soon after, a rebellion in favour of the House of Stuart occurred. Jacobites, whether Scottish, Irish, Welsh or English, Episcopalian, effectively the Church of England in Scotland, re-established by Charles II, but since 1688 without bishops, Catholic, Anglican and nonjuring, the latter refused to swear the oath to the new Hanoverian monarch as head of the Church of England, now had a variety of reasons for supporting a Stuart restoration, from belief in the indefeasible hereditary right of the Stuarts, whatever their religion, coupled with distaste for this foreign, usurper, to the dismantling of the Act of Union, what could be called a Scottish nationalist strain, and toleration for Roman Catholicism. Indeed, from the onset it was in the Stuarts' interest to encourage any anti-Union grievances, fertile ground when Scotland's economy was ailing and the promised terms of the recent union remained undelivered. In such circumstances, the Stuarts could offer themselves as both an outlet for opposition and as a force for redress. Those firmly against the Stuarts, rather than neutral, were more focused in their reasons for preventing their return, the rejection of what they viewed as the French-style absolutist inclinations of the Stuarts, as most recently demonstrated by James II, 7, coupled with the preservation of the 1688-9 revolution principles, the Protestant settlement, the state churches of England and Scotland and the Union. All views, whether Jacobite or Georgite, pro-Hanoverian, Tory or Whig, were spurred by a combination of patriotism, tradition, familial, social and cultural ties as well as religious, financial and political self-interest. This latest Jacobite rebellion, known as the 15, was largely a Scottish, Highland rising led by John Erskine, 6th Earl of Mar, supported by France and with smaller rebellions in the west and northeast of England. Despite initial success and even the arrival from France of James Francis Edward at Peterhead on the northeast coast of Scotland, the rising was effectively over when the Jacobite advance was arrested by an army commanded by Field Marshal John Campbell, 2nd Duke of Argyll and grandson of Monmouth's ally, at the Battle of Sheriff Muir. Mar fled to France. In the aftermath, huge fines were imposed and lands forfeited. Some of the leaders were executed, most notably the Englishman James Radcliffe, 3rd Earl of Derwentwater, while several of the clan chiefs, including Sir Ewan Cameron of Clan Cameron, went into exile. A disarming act came into force in November 1716, which outlawed unauthorised holding or bearing of arms in defined areas of Scotland. Despite these measures, the clan system and culture remained essentially undisturbed, although it is also true that the pro-Stuart Catholic or Episcopalian clans who had once been all-powerful in their regions, such as the Macdonalds and the Camerons, 
became increasingly poor and isolated from political influence, whether that of Edinburgh or London, while pro Hanoverian clans, such as the Presbyterian Campbells, Monroes, or Monroes, and Sutherlands, grew more powerful and wealthy. Another Jacobite attempt four years later, this time with the support of Catholic Spain and led by George Keith, the Earl Mariscal of Scotland, William Murray, Marquess of Tully Barden and his brother Lord George Murray, sons of the Chief of Clan Murray, James Murray, 1st Duke of Athol, all of whom had been exiled for their part in the 15, and Donald Cameron of Lochiel, grandson of Ewan Cameron, d. 1719, also failed. The first Duke of Athol had been born into an Episcopalian family but had shown an inclination for the Kirk, had opposed the Treaty of Union but later proclaimed George I King at Perth, conflicting stances that are reflected in the different allegiances of his three sons. William and George had joined the Jacobite army against their father's wishes and his heir, William, was disinherited in favour of the pro-Hanoverian second son, also James. Meanwhile, a treaty between Britain and France forced James Stuart and his courtiers to move out of France to Avignon, then within the Papal States, and later to Rome. But despite the failure of the 15 and the 19, the threat within Britain from Jacobite plots continued to plague the new British royal dynasty and its Whig government throughout the 1720s and 1730s. James' marriage to the Polish Princess Maria Clementina Sobieska in 1719, the birth only a year later of a male heir, Charles Edward, Prince of Wales, and then in 1725 Henry Benedict, Duke of York, had given renewed focus and energy to the Jacobite cause. For political expediency, the British Whig Prime Minister, Sir Robert Walpole declared publicly that the opposition Tory party in Britain was rife with Jacobitism, which in 1715 was not strictly speaking true. In fact some Tories were offered and accepted important positions of state. Many fervently believed in hereditary right regardless of the religion of the monarch. This could be fudged while a daughter of King James II and VII ruled and, in the case of Queen Anne, displayed an inclination towards the Tory party. But with the arrival of a distant cousin who was not just pro-Whig but avidly anti-Tory, for those isolated from power thoughts naturally turned to a Stuart restoration. If this was the position of a committed minority in 1715, then, as the years rolled on, with a change of monarch, George II R. 1727, and still no respite from effective exclusion from government and high office, it gained ground more generally within the Tory party as the only way out of this political wilderness. So among some, but not all, Tories, and even the Whig opposition to Walpole's government, who showed no sign of losing the grip on power, absence certainly could and did make the heart grow fonder. At the same time, the longer that James and his court remained in exile, the more difficult it must have been for them to sustain a sense of combat readiness for the crucial function within a Stuart restoration. During a previous exile, after the execution of Charles I, 1649, the then Stuart court had been absent for only a decade. By 1740, James had been in exile for over 50 years and for the vast majority of his lifetime. Inevitably this situation had a significant impact on his character, manner and outlook. Each unsuccessful restoration attempt made it more difficult to dismiss the notion that the temporary stay in Rome might become permanent. And as the decades came and went, as the established order seemed more secure and the economy, including Scotland's by the 1730s and 1740s, more buoyant, there was the very real possibility that supporters, even ardent followers, would through necessity learn to live with and even thrive under the House of Hanover. Or just die out. Considering the multitude of stresses he had to endure as best he could, it is not surprising that James is often described as having the air of a man burdened with care and even melancholic. Yet it is still the case that rather than being the decaying remnant of a hopeless cause, in the mid-18th century the purpose of the Stuart court in exile continued to be what it had always been, the restoration of the Stuart dynasty in Britain and Ireland. Its fundamental role was as the central hub for what was an international Jacobite network, 
to maintain and coordinate existing supporters while encouraging new blood, to keep the pressure on sympathetic foreign powers to provide the money, arms and troops for an invasion of Britain, and, despite the difficulties, to act as the core element of a court in waiting, prepared to transfer to London, potentially at a moment's notice, in the event of the restoration. Whatever the day-to-day -day activities of James himself, his household, pensioners and wider entourage, this was the ultimate, overarching goal and where, barring the usual internal disagreements and bickering, their energies were channeled. In the meantime many Scots, Irish, English exiles and their families, having settled in France while the Stuarts had resided at Saint-Germain-en-Laye, near Paris, now occupied influential positions at the court at Versailles, and held commissions or raised Scottish and Irish regiments within the French army. Above all, James made the best of his time in Rome. In 1719, as befitted his position, the Palazzo del Re had been completely refurbished for its new occupant with all the paraphernalia associated with European royalty. The King's Apartment, where James lived, conducted his business and entertained publicly and privately, was on the principal, first, floor. Other rooms were occupied by leading courtiers and household staff, while the princes Charles and Henry had their own separate apartments on the second floor with adjoining bedchambers. The main access to the king's apartment was via a grand staircase to the north, which led to a long sequence of connected rooms, moving from the more public areas via antechambers including a throne or presence chamber and a dining room, to the private rooms to the south, the bedchamber, gallery and closet or cabinet. The walls were lined with portraits of James' parents, James himself and his wife Princess Maria Clementina, who had died in 1735, and their handsome sons. Here also were two spectacular large-scale paintings of the marriage of James and Maria Clementina, and the baptism of Prince Charles, the focus of all future Jacobite hopes. James' household included his groom of the bedchamber, the Scotsman Captain William Hay, and his principal private secretary, another Scotsman, James Edgar. The latter occupied a room next to his master's bedchamber. The largest room in the private area, the gallery, had windows overlooking the piazza which were useful for viewing the comings and goings around this public thoroughfare, and the ceiling decorated with the longed-for Catholic Stuart restoration in mind, two plump putti holding the scepter and crown of England, with other figures representing faith and the Catholic religion. James was also attended by two physicians, Dr. Robert Wright and Dr. James Irwin, and a surgeon, James Murray, all Scots. Beyond this there was the usual panoply of valets de chambre, grooms and coachmen, cooks and washerwomen, all going about their business under the watchful eye of palace and royal bodyguards, also provided by the Pope. Regular visitors to the palazzo would have included the incumbent French and Spanish ambassadors in Rome, who advised James on the current state of play of both the local and international support for his cause. In addition, from 1739 his chief advisers were the French cardinal, Pierre-Paul Guérin de Tenson, and his nephew Jean-Louis Guérin, while the role of chief minister was fulfilled by another cardinal, Domenico Riviera. Such reliance on high-ranking foreign and Catholic individuals was inevitable given where the court resided, as well as the need for a foreign sponsor for any invasion of Britain. But one of the key figures within the exiled court was the Protestant Scot James Murray, Earl of Dunbar. Until 1738 Lord Dunbar had had the important role of governor to Prince Charles, and as such had responsibility for his royal charges education and development, in concert with an Irishman, Sir Thomas Sheridan, as under governor. These two men were crucial in the forming of Charles's character. That his upbringing and education were not all that they should have been, as the future Jacobite leader and king, is stated by several contemporaries. During a visit to Rome between 1739 and 1740, the French writer Charles de Brosses met the princes and described them in a letter as amiable, polite and gracious, both of them have but a mediocre wit, and are less polished than princes should be at their age. One Stuart courtier in Rome said of Prince Charles that, 
Tis true his education has not been in every particular such as a person of his rank is supposed generally to have, but loyally continues, yet by a good fund of sense people will see that nature has supplied whatever may have been wanting in care and industry. James Edgar, who knew the princes as well as their father, perhaps better, describes Charles as an avid sportsman, spending entire days hunting and shooting. Yet at the end of the day he, diverts himself with music for an hour or two, as if he had not been abroad, and plays his part upon the bass viol extremely well, for he loves and understands music to a great degree. Young Henry is less musical, but he sings, when he pleases, much better. N. Finn, were their friends to see them either at home or abroad, they could not but be infinitely charmed with them both. Edgar concludes, offering an indication as to the closeness of the brothers, though of different turns and tempers, they agree very well together and love one another very much. Of Charles's entourage, which in addition to Sir Thomas Sheridan included an equerry, the Englishman Francis Strickland, only Lord Dunbar was a Protestant. That the Stuart heir apparent was not only born and raised a Catholic in Rome, but was dominated by Catholics within the Stuart court itself, troubled some supporters in Britain. Many Protestant Jacobites were happy for the Stuarts to return on any basis, as the God-given hereditary right should not be dismissed at the whim of Parliament and ministers. However, some believed that James and his sons should convert. The French minister, the Marquis d'Argenson, recalled a conversation at the Palace of Versailles with an English Jacobite who insisted the Stuarts must be good Protestants for the sake of their country, and that they, should say, as our Henry IV did of the Mass, a crown is worth more than a sermon. So for some supporters, their religion was not just one of many barriers, but the only barrier to the Stuarts being welcomed back to Britain with open arms. But this lack of cohesion concerning the dynasty's religion hints at inherent tensions within the Jacobite camp. Dealing with the rivalries and personality clashes that inevitably existed among the Jacobite party, whether in Britain, Versailles or Rome, coupled with managing the expectations of James' faithful followers, was a wearying necessity. On this subject James was to advise Charles in a letter, to be on your guard in such cases, since it is our business to favour and protect all good subjects without taking party in their little picks and animosities. Every new attempt that failed, every plot that was foiled, although evidence of a loyal and persistent Jacobite following, resulted in a new influx of exiles seeking refuge and support. Every prince should reward loyalty. But unlike the resources that King George had to hand, taxation in particular, James had to work within quite limited means, as his main income came from the pensions he received from France and the papacy, along with donations, large and small, from his devoted supporters. The business of spying and intelligence gathering cut both ways, inevitably requiring some financial incentive. On one occasion Francis, Lord Semple, one of James' envoys to the court of France, made a payment to a new informer, which James retrospectively agreed to, though, James wrote, I am far from being flush of money at this time. Even if the money was tight, James did, however, have status, excellent connections and influence, as a European prince, an eminent Roman Catholic and, as some considered him, a rightful king. Riviera, James' chief minister, had been nominated to the College of Cardinals, from which a new pope was chosen, by James himself, an example of the influence he wielded as de jure king of England in the eyes of the papacy. Despite its geographical distance from Britain and Ireland, which inevitably made coordinating Jacobite activity more difficult, the Stuart court in Rome had one crucial advantage. Rome was the key destination on the Grand Tour, a cultural rite of passage whereby young male Britons, a term which at this time embraced Irishmen, usually from wealthy, influential families, travelled through Western Europe seeking education, enlightenment and entertainment. Many of the young travellers had relations or associates who had participated in the 15, the 19 and later Jacobite plots and intrigues and who now lived either at 
or within, the orbit of the Stuart Court. Even if a traveller had no direct association, or was hostile to the Stuart cause, the ability to meet and socialise with fellow English, Welsh, Scots and Irishmen so far from home was very welcome indeed. Crucially, the Stuart Court provided practical as well as social support to such travellers. While Britain had no official embassy in Rome, Queen Anne, George I and George II had not been recognised by the papacy, this role was effectively assumed by the exiled Stuart Court. Those employed at the Palazzo del Re lived in rooms within it or in the surrounding area, or, as likely, near the Piazza di Spagna and its environs, the very neighbourhood where many British grand tourists and travellers took lodgings. If a British gentleman walked from the Piazza di Spagna to, let's say, the Forum, it is likely that he would pass the Palazzo del Re en route. He might therefore bump into a member of the Stuart household, or even see the king, chevalier, or pretender, from the French pretendant, meaning claimant, himself. In fact, by 1740 James appears to have developed a daily routine, which, although bordering on the banal, certainly made him easy to locate from one hour to the next. Most remarkable were his public devotions. In the opinion of Charles de Brosses, he is excessively devout. He spends his mornings by his wife's tomb, praying to the holy apostles. In 1741, the artist John Russell wrote to Mrs. R., Your curiosity, madam, no doubt, will expect to find something here concerning the chevalier, a more polite term than pretender, and his two sons. Russell goes on that James passes all his time in a very regular manner, rising early, he spends the morning in business, hears mass at a set hour, and dines at twelve. He often walks in the fine gardens at Rome, especially those of the Villa Borghese. In the evening, he receives visits, sups at ten, and goes to bed about midnight. Such a regime jarred with a young man like Charles, who desired purpose and action. The regular hunting excursions would be normal behavior for any prince or even nobleman. But with Charles, there is a sense that his devotion to such pastimes was a way of occupying himself physically and mentally for want of anything else. In 1740, in an important, some might say belated, move, for the sanity of his son as well as the future of the Stuart cause, James finally allowed the now 20-year-old Charles to attend council meetings, and to share in the intelligence and correspondence arriving in Rome from all over Europe. James may have inclined towards a quiet, devout private life, which acted as the counterbalance to the stresses of his chief business. But he had a public duty and obligations, firstly to his host, the Pope, and more broadly to the Roman nobility, who sustained and dignified his very existence within his temporary adopted city. Secondly, he had an obligation to the Jacobite cause itself. Maintaining visibility allowed the curious, like John Russell, as well as the faithful to observe and evaluate Britain's alternative monarch and his heirs. For a visiting Whig, Tory, Georgiet or Jacobite, the exiled Stuarts held an obvious fascination. Perhaps due to the danger and intrigue surrounding him, there was an avid, almost obsessive interest in James and his sons, and news of them was a conspicuous element of any travel journal or letter home. Every detail was recorded and reported on, how they looked and dressed, how they behaved, who they spoke to and where they went, whether at the opera, attending a ball, walking in the gardens of the Villa Borghese or at mass. Much of this was also useful intelligence for the British government, but such encounters served another purpose to the Stuart cause beyond gossip. The written reports back to friends and family, and the entertaining travel anecdotes at many a tavern gathering or supper party on return, kept the exiled Stuart dynasty alive in the minds of all Britons, whether as the true royal house, the almost legendary leading players of a turbulent recent past, or mythic national bogeymen. To see and be seen, in addition to regular prayers and walks, James supported and regularly attended public musical concerts and the opera, often accompanied by his sons, and the family were usually present at the most lavish balls and festivals that Rome could offer. Such events were also attended by British travellers. 
During a tour of Italy, Joseph Spence, writing from Rome to his mother, Mirabel, in Winchester on the 13th of January 1731, observed, almost casually, that at the opera, we are seated in the second row of boxes, and, whether by good or bad luck, in the very box under the pretenders. He was there last night, with his second son, the eldest was gone, e, out on a party of hunting. Spence continues, though, I never make any visit to my neighbor above stairs, I went over to my L, or, D. Stafford, who is opposite to us, to take a view of them. The two princes were both well schooled in those accomplishments that were for public display and scrutiny. The playwright Samuel Crisp, writing to his friend Christopher Shute, describes a masked ball during the carnival of February 1739, N.S., which was hosted by the Marchese Bolognetti and attended by James and his sons, who were, as usual, the highlight of the event for everyone present. Unsurprisingly, Crisp has a keen eye for theatrical detail. Both princes, he recalls, were, in masquerade habits of two young shepherds wore rich white silk hats with fine diamond loops and buttons bunches of white ribbons at their knees and shoes their faces unmasked. Crisp watched James walk across the room to where a number of English gentlemen were standing, which the playwright believed he had done, on purpose, although, Nobody took any manner of notice of him though he talked English for half an hour together to one of his attendants. I was very next to him and he heard the English gentlemen talking together, all round him. Then the master of ceremonies came and ASKD him, by the name of Sire, if his majesty had a mind to see the young princes dance, to which he answered he should be very glad of it and accordingly the eldest began. Crisp recalled, I never saw anything so genteel. His looks, his gesture, all was the finest, and most expressive that can be imagined. Later both princes got up to begin English country dances, which they have taught all the Roman ladies, who are much pleased with the fashion. Crisp declares his amazement at hearing the tunes, butted peas, Willy Wilkie struck up in a Roman palace. Even if they were already known in Italy, Surely it was the handsome Stuart brothers who made these dances popular among the Roman nobility. However, there was a strategy behind Charles being ordered to dance in front of the English visitors. Two years after Samuel Crisp, John Russell attended another carnival ball at the Palazzo Pamphili in the Piazza Navona, attended by the chief quality, who were all in masquerade. At this event Charles was dressed in a Scotch Highlander's habit, with a bonnet, target, and broad sword, and adorned with jewels to the value of 100,000 Roman crowns. He opened the ball, and was seconded by his brother, they being both respected here as persons of the first rank. The performing of English country dances and the wearing of Highland garb, particularly where Britons could see them, was a clear attempt to present the Stuarts as British. Yet, conversely, such attempts may have simply emphasized just how un-British they now were, in appearance, manner, attitude and outlook, after a half-century in exile. Further, it is worth stressing that even James had little personal experience of the lands he felt destined to rule, the Jacobite Prince of Wales had none at all. Viewing the Stuarts in public was one thing, mixing with their entourage, or even visiting them at the Palazzo del Re, was quite another. The Journal of Alexander Cunningham of 1736-7, who was then travelling with the young artist Alan Ramsey, reveals how easy it was to move into the orbit of the Stuart court. Arriving in Rome at the end of October 1736, the young Scotsman took lodgings in the Piazza di Spagna and almost immediately had regular visits from James' physicians, Dr. Wright and Dr. Irvin. On the 14th of November, N.S. Cunningham and Ramsey witnessed James at his prayers in the Jesuit church and four days later Cunningham records that Dr. Wright dined with me and gave me many diverting histories of the young Chevalier, of his willfulness and restlessness and hardiness, his quickness of capacity. After dinner they went to the Villa Ludovic where both young princes happened to be. The day was concluded with a visit to a coffee house that was frequented by George Seaton, Earl of Winton, who had been out in the 15, and several other of their stamp and there fell a singing old Scots songs and were very merry. 
And so the journal goes on, all innocent enough you might think. But both Cunningham and Ramsey were members of the Jacobite Masonic Lodge in Rome of which Winton was master, another vital mechanism for this international network. As this suggests, the artistic and cultural attractions of Rome were a suitable ruse for any home nation Jacobite, wishing to visit the Stuart court, to leave Britain or Ireland without drawing obvious attention to themselves. To give the full quotation from Sir John Clark of Pennycook, Baron of the Exchequer for Scotland, this rebellion took its rise chiefly in Rome, for some of the Highland chiefs and others, as they travelled into Italy, never failed of visiting the pretender's family, and chiefly made their court to the two princes, Charles and Henry, the sons of the S. I. D. Pretender and the Princess Sobieski, both in appearance handsome sprightly young men. It was treason for any British citizen to set foot in the Palazzo del Re, indeed, even to correspond with James and his family. So adjoining James Edgar's room, within the private area of James' grand apartment, was a small, secret staircase leading down to the Palazzo's south entrance situated directly below the gallery, with its steward restoration ceiling, and located on the Piazza dei Santo Apostoli itself. The staircase allowed visitors to gain access to James and the princes without being seen, even by a majority of the staff and household, some of whom were almost certainly British government spies. David, Lord Elko, the young heir of the staunchly Jacobite Lord Weems, recounts this at length during his own travels in 1739-40. He was brought to the palazzo by James Groom of the bedchamber William Hay and entered through a little door that led into the cellars. Hay pointed towards a staircase or ladder up which Lord Elko was to climb. Having followed instructions, Lord Elko emerged from the secret stair into James Edgar's chamber and was then shown into a suite of rooms. He was told that James was awaiting him in the fourth along. Lord Elko duly found him there, the room no doubt dimly lit for this clandestine encounter, and after having kissed his hands he made me sit close to him before the fire. As Lord Elko continues, James then told me that he knew that my father was very attached to him, and that this would be taken into consideration should he ever come to the throne. The exchange was as much to do with information gathering as encouraging the young man's continued loyalty. James then rang a bell to summon the princes, and Lord Elko kissed their hands. James made me stand back to back with the elder, Prince Charles, who was a year older than I and much taller. Lord Elko was dismissed and concluded the episode with a supper tete a tete with James Edgar, who told me that of all the British visitors, the Duke of Beaufort was the one who most often climbed the ladder. This was a group who needed to maintain a profile in Britain and to manage and expand their support base. Fostering greater loyalty by allowing young men from loyal families access to James and the Princes, Encouraging a sense of intimacy and exclusivity while also appealing to their sense of adventure was absolutely vital. John Murray of Broughton, another heir to a staunch Scottish Jacobite, travelled to Rome in about 1737 and in similar circumstances met James and his sons. According to a later memoir, Murray was brought into their presence to kiss their hands and then had a long discussion with Charles. As a result, the young Scottish gentleman was bewitched, as an adoring description of the prince written a few years later amply reveals. Charles was not only tall, physically perfect with refined features, pale red hair and stunning dark brown eyes, but had a dignity and an unspeakable majesty diffused through his whole mien and air, which inspired awe in those who witness it, making him, without exception, the most surprisingly handsome person of the age. Furthermore, Charles was a happy combination of the good nature of the Stuarts with the spirit of his Polish Sobieski forefathers and therefore equally qualified to preside in peace and war. Ignoring for a moment the gushing hyperbole, Charles still emerges as a young man who is not only charming and attractive, but one who can stimulate admiration and even adoration in his followers. Such traits might carry a determined and focused individual a very long way indeed. So, far from moribund, the Stuart court, under challenging circumstances, kept the flame of Jacobitism very much alive in Great Britain. 
but James and all right-thinking Jacobites knew that whatever the strength of support for the Stuart cause at home, in addition, and crucially, they required the active military and financial support of a foreign power to achieve the longed-for restoration. In reality, by 1740, the only real contender was France. 